Thanks for carving out just a little bit of your day today to spend it here with me. Uh, my goal today really is just that at the end of this session that you felt like this was a good investment of your time. But let's jump in. The topic for today is navigating early retirement and severance. Whoop, sorry about that. I'll get this. Uh, just a quick disclosure that uh, I'm kind of required to read, so I want to do it. Granted Harbor is a registered investment advisory firm. Nothing I discuss is intended to be legal or investment advice. None of the information contained here constitutes an offer to buy or sell any financial instrument or security. Now that I got that out of the way, most of you on the call know the managing partners of Granite Harbor Advisors, but if you're new to our firm, I'll introduce the three of us. You have Brian Sack, Nick Brown, and myself, Tim Smith. We're all three managing partners of Granite Harbor. Uh, we have a great staff uh, that works for us that uh, if you've been in the office, uh, you've got to know them a little bit and you can see that they're passionate as well as we are about what we do. And as a, a whole, the whole firm really works hard to help families uh, live their best lives. And we do that through the implement, implementation of holistic financial planning, investment management, as well as insurance solutions. On the agenda today for navigating early retirement, I'll be covering some uh, issues around cash flow considerations. We'll be talking about income tax planning and how that relates to early retirement. We'll also be talking uh, towards the end of the discussion about some unique as well as normal risk associated with uh, early retirement. And then I'll wrap up just by talking about making sure you've got the tools to choose the right planning strategy. So cash flow considerations. Some of the items that we'll be talking about as it relates to cash flow in early retirement, we'll be talking about maximizing employer sponsored plans, the timing of severance payments. We'll talk a little bit about restricted stock, cash bonuses, performance, uh, per performance bonuses, knowing your company's plan. We'll be talking a little bit about pension elections and then a big one for most people that lose, they lose sleep about is what are my health care costs going to be in retirement? And then finally, we'll talk about Social Security. But how does uh, maximizing your employer sponsored plan play into early retirement? Well, most of us know about 401k plans and the fact that there are deferral limits of 19,500. But if you're over the age of 50, you can do a catch-up provision of 6,000. So that's roughly a $25,000 deferral limit that you can put into your 401k plan. But how does that play into the decision of whether you're going to or when you decide to, to retire early? So think of it this way. If you were to leave your employer, say in the first quarter of the year, March, because these deferral limits are a dollar amount, you should consider prepaying those uh, deferrals and get all of the dollars in in the first quarter. So if you've got $25,000 worth of income in that first quarter, you could defer it into your 401k plan. The importance of that obviously is you're attempting to reduce your taxable income in a year where you potentially may have some severance, large severance payments. So just a, a consideration that you need to be thinking about. As it relates to post-tax contributions, your employer may uh, provide a plan that allows you as the employee to contribute on a post-tax basis. And those limits are $58,000, although it's encompassing of any contributions that you would make on a pre-tax basis. But this can be an effective tool for those that are near or at retirement because any of those dollars that you contribute on a post-tax basis can be used in a strategy of rolling over into a Roth to get tax-free 
growth going forward. And so that is something that you might want to consider if your plan allows for it. Now, I could probably stop right there and that would be enough of uh, some considerations that you'd say, hey, this was a valuable use of my time. But I can hear you screaming at the computer, the word no. Now I hear the chance of more. So I will continue. Let's talk a little bit about deferred compensation. And really what we're talking about there is for those as a reminder, a deferred compensation plan just allows you to take current year income and kind of push that out into the future. Where is that important as it relates to early retirement? If you're thoughtful and you plan it out right, knowing what year that you might possibly retire, you could schedule income to be deferred in that year, thereby lowering your taxable exposure. When we're talking about distribution timing of the uh, deferred comp election, what we're talking about there is that if you have a plan and you choose to defer your income, you have to make an election uh, with that deferral, meaning when am I going to receive that income? And there's some restrictions around changing those elections. And you just have to be conscious of it and be disciplined and thoughtful about uh, when you're going to make those elections. To give you an example, if you were closer near to retirement, to make a change in the election, say you wanted to you know, elect next year's uh, deferral to be pushed out, you have to make it at least 12 months prior to receiving the income. And in today's environment, if you make a change, you have to push it out a minimum of five years. And the third bullet point is really just saying that an income threshold of around $300,000 is where these deferred comp plans come into play and they're effective because most people lose some of their ability to, to uh, contribute to other benefit type plans. When we're talking about timing of severance payments, potentially if you're going to receive a, a large severance payment in the last year of, of working, you might possibly be able to spread those severance payments out over multiple years. And so that would be a, a, a consideration that you might need to take into account if you're going to receive a, a severance payment. So cash and bonus plans, just really need to know, hey, what is my company's policy as it relates to, to bonuses? You know, are they based upon tenure? Um, you know, in terms of do I have to work at uh, 1231, do I have to be employed to receive a bonus? The last thing you would want is to leave your employer mid-year and find out that you just made yourself ineligible for a bonus because you have to be employed on 1231. So pension elections as it relates to early retirement, let's talk about that. Most of you are familiar about, with these terms of lump sum versus annuity payments. What I'm gonna discuss is what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of both. As it relates to lump sum payments, you know, you're really talking about giving yourself some additional liquidity. So by taking a lump sum amount, you can add that to your other portfolio assets, can be used for whatever purpose that you desire. You're also uh, throwing the lump sum dollars into your portfolio mix, giving you the potential of upside growth as well as that inflation protection. The other advantage is that now those dollars are in your asset base, you'll be able to pass those assets on to the second generation. On a, from a disadvantage standpoint for lump sum payments, you're not gonna get a guaranteed income stream that an annuity would give you. A little less certain cash flow, uh, future cash flow if you uh, take a lump sum. And then also you don't, you know, you lose that survivor benefit. With a lot of annuity payments, your spouse can continue the payment uh, after you uh, pass as the employee. In terms of annuity payments, some of the advantages are obviously you're getting lifetime guaranteed income. Um, you're getting a predictable cash flow, not only for yourself, but for your spouse. A disadvantage though would be 
you're, you know, on an election, if you live 30 years receiving that annuity payment, you know, inflation is going to bite away at your purchasing power. So um, you're going to lose a little bit there in terms of what, you know, you can buy with your dollar 30 years out, let's say. Um, you can't transfer to the next generation those annuity payments. Once you and your spouse have, have gone, that, that transfer is not available. And you don't, have that, you don't have that liquidity that a lump sum payment is going to give you. When we're talking about credit risk from the company, ERISA does protect annuity pension payments, but that protection is limited. So if the company were to default or go into bankruptcy, uh, and you had a very, very large annuity payment, some of that could be exposed to some risk. A strategy though, if you were to choose an annuity payment, something that you might consider is what we call a strategy of pension maximization using life insurance. And it's a little bit of a hybrid in terms of taking a lump sum or an annuity payment. And what the a strategy really looks like is that if you had a calculation made of, hey, what's my annuity payment if I just take a single life of payment and then had it calculated, what would I get if I took an annuity payment based on both myself and my spouse? What's that delta or difference? And pension maximization using life insurance is just taking a portion of that difference and investing it into some life insurance uh, to replace the annuity payment that would go away should, that, should the employee pass. The benefits of that obviously are that you would have increased cash flow in retirement because now you're getting the higher annuity payment. You'd have flexibility on first spouse's death, whether it's the spouse or the employee. And you would have no loss of value of income in the event the beneficiary dies first because now that life insurance is going to be used to continue paying out to the spouse. And you're gonna preserve some of that pension uh, payment because now you've got the life insurance that's lumped into your other assets that can be left to the next generation. Again, this is something that a lot of people are losing a little sleep over because they know that the rise in healthcare costs and especially during retirement. So how does it relate to if you were to retire early, say at age 60, now you've got a five year gap to get to Medicare. And some of the options that you have in terms of how you, you cover that period of time is some employer plans, while not all, will offer what's called COBRA. Many of you have heard of that term, but COBRA allows you to stay on your employer's plan with you paying 100% of those uh, premiums, but you can keep that coverage up to 18 months. So while it wouldn't fill the whole gap of five years, if you were say close to 63 when you retired, you could almost fill the gap to Medicare by, by purchasing COBRA. While there are a few employers today that offer retiree health benefits, they are still around. And so the spousal plan is really that some of those plans not only cover the employee, but they also cover the spouse. A nice benefit if you have it, but it's becoming uh, less popular today, just sheerly because of the cost to employers. So if you, you know, once your COBRA's used up or you don't have uh, retiree benefits from your employer, the only two other places that you can go out into the marketplace are to look to the public or private marketplace. And when we talk about public marketplace, we're talking about the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, where you can go out and buy coverage, um, or you can go out into the individual marketplace uh, and purchase insurance yourself. One of the things that you do want to consider though, as a strategy while you're working, if you're an employee that is contributing to say an HSA account, that's the type of account where you can put pre-tax dollars into. So it's a tax favored type savings program. And again, it has to be tied into a high deductible plan. But if you're allowed to do that, you should consider putting money into an H HSA account 
because the accumulation of those dollars can be used during this period to pay for healthcare costs. So how does Social Security uh, tie into early retirement? As we all know, early retirement for Social Security is age 62. And so this is a chart that just kind of compares, hey, what would your full age benefit be versus if you started turning on Social Security at age 62? And let's kind of just focus, it's a busy uh, chart, but focus on 1959, because that person would be turning 62 this year. And so if they elected to go ahead and take their Social Security this year, they would actually receive a 29.17% reduction in their full benefit. And so, you know, you can look at the dollar amounts and you really need to kind of sit down and be thoughtful and plan out, hey, when is the right time to turn on my social security? Because it's different for everybody. You can't really make this decision in a vacuum. You really need to wrap together what your total cash flow, what assets you have, and what is the need? Is there a cash flow need to take those dollars today? And we advise clients every day around this issue. And we really do focus on the cash flow needs of the client. So let's talk a little bit about income tax planning as it relates to early retirement. No, when we're talking about income tax planning, we'll be addressing, you know, an, an issue of bridging the gap to age 59 and a half, managing taxes efficiently. We'll talk about some tax diversification strategies. And then we'll talk a little bit about the, some of the proposed legislation changes. Uh, you may or may not have heard in the news, if you've been paying attention to it, uh, there's always talk of tax increases. So bridging the gap, what do we mean? So if you've done all of your savings inside, say, a 401k plan, you really can't touch those dollars normally in retirement accounts till you're 59 and a half. But there are some exceptions to that. So if you've got large IRAs from previous employers and you saved a significant uh, amount of money and say you're 55, you, there is access to those retirement accounts. And it's really by taking an election called 72T. And what 72T is, is it's just a systematic a payment stream of income that has to continue for a minimum of five years or until you're 59 and a half. Um, you, uh, that's, the calculation is based upon uh, your life expectancy. So how, do, how does 401k plan access if you're 55? Well, the government says that, hey, if you're 55, you can be fired, separated, laid off from service. But if you're 55 years of age, you can access 401k plan dollars without paying that 10% premature distribution. When we talk about you know, uh, the ideal asset allocation for post-tax assets, what we're really talking about is that the amount of equities versus uh, bonds that you have in your portfolio. And you need the right mix looking at, hey, what are your cash flow needs in retirement and making sure that you've kind of locked up either four to seven years uh, of income security. And we typically go through this with our clients in terms of how we map out what are your cash flow is going to be during retirement. When we talk about managing taxes efficiently, there are several things that we would be covering and that's things like charitable giving acceleration. When we're talking about stock options, there's a section 83B election that can be made. You know, minimizing uh, other income sources during, uh, during that year of separation from your employer. And then we can talk a little bit about conservation easements and opportunity zone investing. Uh, th that's an option for those that have accumulated enough wealth, have highly appreciated uh, real estate. Those might be an option for you. So charitable giving acceleration, what are some of the things that can be talked about? We've got seven types of 
tools that you might consider using. So there's a, there's a strategy called donor advisor funds. Whether or not you're, uh, you know, you understand these, let me just briefly tell you, a, a donor advisor fund really allows you to take a large amount of money, place it into a donor advisor fund, getting the deduction in the year that you transfer it, but then the donations can be directed by you over time. So a very useful tool uh, from a charitable acceleration. Uh, I highly appreciated real estate uh, can be donated. Cash obviously has a threshold of 60% of AGI, but it's a very common use of charitable giving. Highly appreciated stock has an AGI floor of 30%, but can be an effective tool because you're donating um, highly appreciated value for something that you, you didn't pay maybe uh, 10 cents on the dollar for say 20 years ago. Um, so you're basically not gonna pay any tax and you get the donation at the fair market value today of that, that stock. Charitable trust, a common strategy is using either a charitable lead trust or a charitable remainder trust. Just briefly, a charitable remainder trust would be a tr an irrevocable trust whereby the dollars that you put into that that trust would be used for, um, uh, you know, the charity and the, or, or you would live off the income, excuse me, off of that irrevocable trust. And then the remaining amount would be donated to the, the charity. A charitable lead trust is just the opposite in that the charity receives the income out of the trust, but then once you die, those assets would be passed down to your heirs. And then you can also use retirement accounts or life insurance as a gifting strategy. And then for those who have accumulated a lot of wealth, a popular uh, strategy is to use a private foundation. So we talked a little bit about stock options. And one of the things that you can do is you can file an election 83B with the IRS where you're asking for those stock options to be taxed at the grant date versus the vesting date. And you would do this strategy with stock that you feel is going to be appreciating highly over the next few years. So managing taxes efficiency around other income sources. Uh, we've talked already that, you know, the timing of deferred compensation is, a, is something that you can do. Maximizing retirement savings accounts. One of the things that you might consider that, that uh, you may or may not have thought of is that you can prepay or postpay your real estate taxes. Timing or collection of passive income, turning it on or off if you have the ability to do that, you know, around that early year of retirement. And we're talking in the context of, hey, you're going to have large lump sum dollars possibly from a severance package. So you don't need additional income such as capital gains exposure. And you may need to communicate that to uh, whoever is managing your investment dollars that, hey, I've got a lot of income this year because of a severance package. I don't need additional income from my stock portfolio. We mentioned conservation easements and opportunity zone investing. Again, these are really just strategies whereby if you've got highly appreciated real estate you can utilize these tools um, as well. So tax diversification strategies. So most highly compensated uh, individuals are already using these two buckets to uh, accumulate wealth. And on a pre-tax basis, they're using 401k plans, pension plans, as well as IRAs, all on a pre-tax basis, getting a, a tax benefit today. But as we all know, that that's not gonna be the case in the future as far as taxes go, because those accounts will be 100% taxable when you go to access those dollars. But where you can kind of layer up, and most people are doing, is to really look at outside investment, such as brokerage accounts, real estate, things of that nature, where they kind of have a blend. You know, you're using after-tax dollars, 
maybe there's some tax paid as you turn over your stock portfolio, but in the future, you're gonna pay some additional tax, obviously when you start accessing those accounts. And so we advise clients to really diversify their holdings from a tax uh, situation. And there's a third uh, really bucket that we kind of bring into the mix for our clients where we talk about tax advantage type situation. And we already mentioned kind of the, the Roth planning that you can do with those dollars in a qualified plan uh, over and above your pre-tax savings. Um, but cash value life insurance is a very useful tool if structured properly. And so if you contribute to a life insurance policy and you can grow the cash value of that policy, those dollars can be accessed just like a Roth tax-free. And so it does have to be designed correctly and it's, it's an individual thing in terms of really analyzing, hey, is this the right thing for me? We talked uh, a little bit, uh, but I'll go a little bit more in depth in terms of the proposed tax legislation. So as you know, there were uh, a lot of talk in the campaign last year by the current administration, as well as this year about raising taxes. So we're kind of like, you know, cringing, holding on, we know it's coming. Um, but just to kind of go over what the proposed income tax changes are, you know, currently in 2021, the top bracket is 37%. And they're proposing to change that top rate to 39.6. But the big difference really is not at the rate because two and a half percent doesn't seem to be like a big deal, but it's the thresholds that are important to note because currently as a single filer, you don't hit that top 37% until your income's over 523,000. And for a married couple, you don't hit that top threshold till your income's over 628,000. And under the proposed changes, both single and married will hit that top threshold at $400,000 of income. The proposed changes as it relates to long-term or excuse me, long-term capital gain tax, uh, the current top rate is 20%. Uh, and they're looking at if your income is over a million dollars, you in effect will be paying a 40% capital gains tax. So let's talk about some of the unique risk as it relates to early retirement. You know, we all know that we're living longer. This chart just kind of illustrates that in that if you're a male and you're 65 years of age today, you've got a 50% chance of living to the age of 87. And if you're a 65 year old female, you can have a 50% chance of living to age 89. And it goes up even higher if you're, if you're a married couple and you're 65, you've got a 50% chance of living to be 93. And so what risk does that pose to er retiring early? And really what we're talking about there, now you've got a longer period of time that you've got to create income or secure income during those years. And so we use a, a rate of 4%, we call it the 4% rule, where we say if you've accumulated enough that you can live on 4% of your portfolio, it doesn't matter what the year that you, you, know, you live to because your portfolio will generate the income necessary no matter what the period of time is. So guaranteed income would be another solution in terms of you know, securing your, your income through your lifetime. Earlier we talked about annuity payments they typically will pay for the rest of your life. What is the sandwich generation? We're really talking about, as you know, most people are waiting longer and longer to have children into their late 30s, early 40s. Well, what that's creating is you've got folks that not only have small children that they're raising, but now they've got elderly parents that they have to take care of as well. So something that 
needs to be planned for obviously is the long-term care cost of parents. You can see by this chart that 75% of people over the age of 65 will need some form of long-term care. And you can also see by the chart what those costs are as an average amount today. What are they going to be 20 years from now, 30 years from now? The average cost of raising a child today is about $13,000. And for those of us uh, who have sent our kids off to college, we can relate to these numbers at the bottom. Sequence of returns, what are we talking about there as it relates to early retirement? Well, getting performance in retirement is one thing, but when you get the performance is also important. And what this chart illustrates is what if I had high returns in the early years versus if I had negative returns in the early years? And this is a million dollar portfolio that at a 6% uh, return withdrawing $60,000 a year off of that portfolio, what it would do if I got high returns in the first two years, meaning 30% in the first year, 20% in the second, consistent returns thereafter with negative returns coming on the back end in year nine and year 10. And a million dollar portfolio that you pulled out $600,000 over 10 years would still have over a million dollars under that scenario. But here's just the opposite. What if we threw the negative returns into year one and year two? That same portfolio of a million dollars that we're pulling $60,000 off of, you can see that after year 10, that portfolio has you know, fell below $400,000. So performance is important, but also the sequence of that performance is gonna come into play in terms of you having enough assets to live on. So what are some of the normal retirement risks as it relates to early retirement? And we've, we've done an acronym called LIMIT because the goal really is to limit risk when possible. We're talking about liquidity risk, inflation risk, market risk, interest rate risk, as well as tax risk. Liquidity risk, right? You know that, hey, if your assets or your portfolio are all in a stock, port stock or fixed income bond portfolio, very, very liquid. You can get access to those dollars whenever you need them. But you have to consider if you're a highly uh, leveraged person in real estate, it's not quite as liquid, liquid uh, should you need the money in a given year. Inflation risk, the silent killer, right? Cost of bread in 1940, a loaf of bread was 10 cents. In 2018, that same loaf of bread cost you $3.20 today. Probably not as healthy bread as it was either in 1940, right? Market risk. So one of the things that we're really conscious of when we put together portfolios for our clients is making sure that we've diversified their holdings across different companies. And so, you know, we wanna make sure that we're, you know, picking up asset classes that are global portfolios as well. We're not just investing domestically, but we're investing on a global basis. And looking at the asset classes, making sure that we have good diversification between the asset classes held inside their portfolio. And when we're talking about market risk and how we diversify market risk, we're really talking about holding non-correlating assets uh, in, the, in the portfolio. And as we talked earlier about the sweet sequence of returns risk, performance is one thing, but the timing of those returns is a big factor in how, how and if you can retire early. When we talk about interest rate risk, the asset class that's affected most is really bonds. And bonds are affected by the overall yield when the interest rate environment is changing, the underlying value of that bond is affected, as well as the reinvestment ability of those bonds. And so if you talk about what are some of the possible solutions around uh, that is really 
looking at a strategy such as laddering bonds. So if you, if you hold individual bonds, you can ladder those for a duration that meets your cash flow needs. And so that's what we do with clients that need that consistent income and we can control the volatility of the interest rate environment by laddering them. Also along the yield curve and taking advantage of spread changes is something that we do on a daily basis, but just keeping the portfolio flexible where we can adjust based upon what's happening in the interest rate environment. When we're talking about tax, 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 tax risk, excuse me, we're talking about looking at future legislation changes, the imbalance of qualified versus non-qualified dollars, you know, making sure that you don't have too much money inside your either retirement accounts or your 401k, knowing that all of those are gonna be taxed, but trying to mirror up a diversified portfolio where you can kind of manage your taxable income during retirement. And then looking at capital gains exposure. Tax implications to surviving spouses. Some people don't really uh, spend a whole lot of time thinking about this, but you do need to be thoughtful in that, you know, if you were to pass, your spouse is gonna receive a reduced social secur security benefit that was coming in for the household. And you're going to pay, that spouse is going to pay a higher tax rate because now they're filing as a single holder versus a married filing joint, and they're gonna have a lower standard deduction. So as I kind of wrap up today, I just wanna talk uh, finally about choosing the right planning resource. And you, know, you can go it alone. We meet a lot of people that they love this type of thing in terms of putting a plan together, looking at uh, portfolio analysis and managing their own account. It requires a special talent in that you have to be very disciplined and look at um, you know, the, the time and effort that it takes to kind of go it alone. Obviously our firm is a professional firm. If you were to hire a firm like ours, we put together some questions that you might ask a firm like ours to make sure that you're comfortable, that they have your best interest at heart. And we put together 10 questions. The first one being, are they acting as a fiduciary uh, for you? What is their investment philosophy? How are they compensated? Are they transparent with that compensation? Is, you know, how is their team supporting them? You know, who will be your primary advisor that you're going to be talking to? What services do they offer? And what's their continuity plan, right? So when you get start to have gray hairs like I do, I get the questions every once in a while. Hey, Tim, if you're not around, what's going to happen to me? So you need to ask that question up front. And then what conflicts of interest does the advisor have and how have they disclosed those to you? Is the overall allocation in line with, with your risk tolerance? And what does the portfolio architect consist of? And what is their rebalancing process and what triggers are being used uh, in that rebalancing? So those are just a, you know, just a few questions, but hopefully you can find those useful if you're in the marketplace for looking for an advisor these are the things that you need to consider. If you have any questions, we are here, we're available. We would love to sit down and chat with you one-on-one -on -one to answer any questions that may have come up from this presentation today. We definitely appreciate you carving out a little bit of your time today to spend it with us. Um, again, the three partners, we really appreciate our clients. We appreciate the fact that we get to do this on a daily basis. And so with that, I've given you back about 20 minutes of the hour to uh, spend uh, doing whatever, but I really do appreciate you jumping on. And so with that, I'm going to sign off. Thanks again, everybody for joining in today. I do appreciate it.